Well, we're starting a series in the book of Nehemiah, and a lot of times people hear that and they go, oh me, and then oh my. And they think, how can something that's over in the Old Testament, something dealing with a wall and building a wall have to do to relate to me? And I'm going to tell you there are some life-changing lessons that takes place in the book of Nehemiah. And the first thing we're going to look at this morning is chapter 1 of Nehemiah. The title of this is The Awakening. And as we're looking at this and we're thinking about this series about rising up, about taking the things in which are tore down, the things of rubbish, and bringing it up and using it for the honor and the glory of God in which it was designed to use. I challenge you this morning, if you have a Bible, I ask you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. If you don't, reach in a pew and grab one, but don't close it because we're going to go right through it. And I want you to see it for yourself. We're going to look at verses 2 and 3 are our key verses. And as we look at this in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the wall of Jerusalem is broke down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now we hear that and we say, what in the world does that have to do with me? That has to do with gates being burnt, the walls being torn down, about these guys coming and dealing with the ones in whom were killed and explaining what had happened has a lot to do with you. It has a lot to do with me. It has a lot to do with our relationship with the Lord. And it's something that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to understand, we need to hear, and we need to apply. And I want you to stay with me this morning. This morning is not going to be a long message, but it's going to be a fast message. And I'm going to tell you, if you blink on me or you fall asleep on me, you're going to miss it. So let's get into this. Our very first point is God showed his people mercy. Do you notice there in verse 3, he was asking who survived? He's wanting to know how many people made it out. How many people escaped this traumatic event in which had just took place? And as you continue looking there in verse 3, he starts asking what is left what, what has happened? And they start telling him how the walls have, have been destroyed, how the gates were destroyed by fire. You say, well, why is he wanting to know this? Well, for some of us, whenever you are raised in a certain place and you have to leave that area and you go somewhere else, home is always home. Wherever you are placed may be home at the time. But your heart is always back where you were raised. That is always home. And for me, home is down in South Mississippi. I I like this place. It's very nice. I've been here for several years, and for my family, it's home. But for me, where my heart is, is back in South Mississippi. And when I go back and I visit home, I see the things that aren't the way they used to be. I see barns that are starting to fall down. I see fences that are falling down that I can remember that we had to make sure that was good. The, the chicken houses that we had, the roofs are starting to cave in. Things are just falling apart. And I look back and I look at the remnants of what used to be. And my heart aches many times when I go back and I see that and I think, oh man, if I could just go back and I could get all that fixed, the things that could be taking place. But then I say, that's not where God has placed me. That is not what God has called me to do. God has called me to Oxford. God has called me to be here. But Nehemiah, all of a sudden, he was in his position. He was at this place and he was working under the king as a cupbearer. God had placed him there. And God was doing great things. But Nehemiah's brother comes and tells him about all the tragedy that starts happening. Nehemiah is starting to have flashbacks of how things used to be. He's wanting to know about friends and families, really is who has survived. And then he's wanting to know, what is there left for me to work with if I go back and I repair this? And Nehemiah is thinking, really, what is it that's left? And he realizes how God showed mercy of the people that truly were able to get out of this. And he starts realizing how God showed mercy, how the things are still there, it just needs to be put back together. 
And he's seeing God's mercy, God's hand in this situation. Our second point, look at verse number four. God stirred a heart. He stirred the heart of Nehemiah. And we notice, it says, as soon as he heard these words, he sat down and wept. He heard the reports from his brothers and these other men that had come to where Nehemiah was at. He heard the reports. He heard all that was happening. And then check out what happens as he's hearing the report. He starts crying and he starts mourning. Because his heart is broken. His heart is broken on what used to be. His heart is broken on that his home is gone. Now think about that. It's sad that we now live in a culture of Christianity. That we can talk about the good old days of how God used to do stuff and think we've seen God's hands moving. But the sad thing is our hearts aren't broken about it anymore. We go, well, yeah, that's how it was. I got news for you, Christians. We need to start mourning over that. We need to start shedding tears over that. We need to start asking God, will you use me Will you use me to rise up and build this nation to become a Christian nation in how it was founded? Will you use me to reach this world for your glory and for your honor? Nehemiah realized as he's crying, as he's weeping there in verse number four of what he was needing to do. And then if you notice toward the end of verse 4, it says he started praying. He started fasting and praying before God. He started seeking God harder than he ever had before because his heart was getting stirred with emotions of, what, of the past. He was getting stirred with emotions of things of which he needed to do. He realized he was not really exactly where God needed him to be. And he knew that it was time for him to move. It was time for him to be placed right where God needed him to be. Now we move on down this chapter. We go down to verses 5 and 6. Our third point, God broke Nehemiah's heart. When you look there in verse number 5, he remembered God's love and mercy. He starts realizing the great and awesome God who kept his covenants and his steadfast love. He's remembering of this God of how he was raised and the things in which God did for him. And he's remembering what God can do because of what he did back there and what God can do in the future which is in front of him. Guess what? That same God that did this with Nehemiah can do that with you can do that with me. But the problem is, there's too many Christians that aren't willing to rise up. There's too many Christians asleep at the wheel. There's too many Christians not willing to become awakened and be stirred by the Spirit of God. And as you continue looking there, look at the, as that verse continues at verse number 6. He needed God more than ever. He says, let your ears be attentive. Let your eyes open to hear the prayers of your servant that I now pray. Not what I prayed weeks ago or years ago or in the past. He's saying, God, I need you more than ever. I need you to open up your ears. I need you to open up your eyes. I need you to hear me. As I am seeking you, as I am praying, as I am fasting, and I am pursuing you. Do you think that got the heart of the Lord's attention? Oh, yeah. You know what the Lord is looking for? When you look in the Scriptures, the Scripture says the Lord is looking for those hearts whom are fully committed to God. He's looking for hearts that are committed and willing to be obedient. He is looking for hearts that are willing to go. He is looking for hearts that are willing to accomplish the unaccomplishable. He's willing for Christians to tackle tasks that no one else will tackle. 
That's what the Lord is looking for. And the Lord started seeing that being stirred up in Nehemiah's heart. And as it continues there in verse number 6, look at the last part. He had to be in step with God. It says he started confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. He started getting the sin issues between him and God and sin between the people right between the Father. Because he realized, he said, for this to be accomplished, I have to be in step with you, Lord. I have to say yes, and I have to be willing to go. But Father, I have to know which way to step. I need to know which way to go. Because Nehemiah knew if he tried to do this on his own strength, his own ability, his own understanding, he was going to fail. But as we're looking at this and we're seeing this, Nehemiah realizes that he has to be in step with the Father. Look down at verse number 7, our fourth point. God started, brought him to repentance. Now, there's one thing when we start confessing sin. But then when we start taking it to a whole nother level and we start repenting and we start naming our sins. Many times as Christians, we just, Lord, forgive me of my sins. We wipe it with a big brush. You know what your sins are. Guess what? God does too. But we think we can wipe it with a big brush and we can just kind of cover it up. He ain't going to cover it up from the Father. It's not going to happen. But we, as Christians, need to be real with God and we need to repent. We don't need to just confess it, but we need to repent. And you say, well, what is the importance about the word repent? Repent means that once we have brought it before God, we leave it there with Him and we get up and we no longer turn to it. We no longer allow it to be a part of our lives. We mean what we're praying to the Father. Look at verse number 7. <clears throat> it says, We have acted very corrupted against you. He realized he needed to repent because he's realizing the corruption and what has come into his heart. The second thing he starts doing is the sin was corruption and not keeping the commandments. See that? We have not kept the commandments. He's telling God, he says, we've not stayed true to your word. We've not stayed true to what you've told us to do. We've allowed these sins to come into our life and corrupt us. And we have fallen away from you, Lord. Does that sound familiar to what's happening today? Does that sound familiar to what's happening to some of us today? Yeah. It does. It continues on there in verse number 7. He turned back to the Word of God. Do you see there the last part of that sentence? The rules that you commanded your servant Moses. He's starting to talk about the Word of God. He's starting to talk about the Scriptures. Nehemiah, do you think God didn't know about the Scriptures? Yes, God knew about the Scripture. God knew the things in which Moses had proclaimed. He knew the commandments. But Nehemiah is saying, Lord, these commandments in which you've given Moses, these Ten Commandments, we've sinned against all ten of them. And we have pretty much have just let them go to the wayside and they're no longer a part of our lives anymore. And he's saying, but Lord, we need to bring these things back in line with you. And we need to stay obedient and true to it. You see, when you really want to start getting God's attention, you start showing him his word. Because he's going to show you and allow you to see your commitment as you're quoting that scripture back to him. And then he's going to start showing you how true his word is. And it's showing us that in verse number 7. Now, come on down, verses 10 and 11, our fifth point. God sent a vision. There's something that needs, that happens in these verses, in verses 10 and 11. He said, 
They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. And by your great power and by your strong hand. He's telling God, he's saying, because of all your might, because of all your power, you have done these great things. And then all of a sudden, verse 11 starts happening. He knew God was getting him ready to use him. He knew God was about to send him to pray for his servants who deliver, to delight in fear of your name. He's talking about those in whom get right, get their heart right with the Lord, who get in step with the Lord. And he's saying, I know it's about to happen. He knew that he, he needed God to be successful. Do you see that in verse 11? And give success to your servant today. Nehemiah knew he couldn't be successful by his own might and power and understanding. But he's asking God to give him success through him. Through him. And one of the last things we notice here is he knew he had to obey no matter what the cost. Look at the very last part of verse 11. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. <clears throat> he knew he was going to have to go before the king and tell the king, look, I got to go. I got to go back home. And I got some things I got to do. And the, cup, and the king's going to be like, man, what? And he's going to be, God's telling me to do this. Well, guess what? This king could have killed him. This king could have told him no. This king could have told him a whole lot of things. And he had to go before the king and be under the mercy of this earthly king and say, king, I need to go. And this king could have answered one way or another. But next week we're going to find out how this whole thing turned out. But here's the thing. Nehemiah knew he had to go before this earthly king no matter what the cost. My challenge and my question to you this morning, are you willing to awaken? Are you willing to rise up and be the man or woman in whom God wants you to be to do extraordinary things for him no matter what the cost? What if you're going to be laughed at? What if you're going to be persecuted? What if you're going to be ridiculed? What if you're going to lose friends? What if you're going to maybe even lose some family members? If you say yes to God, are you willing to? Or are you just going to leave life as it always has been? You realize it is your call. It is your choice to say, yes, God, I will rise up and I will be the man or woman in whom you've called me to be. I will be the one in whom goes back and uses that rubbish and builds that wall. I will be the one in whom you have asked to go and build those gates. I will be the one in whom years past that great revivals took across our nation. I will be the one in where revival can start. It can start with me and it can start right here. But the thing is, is we need men and women to say, yes, Lord, it can start right here with me. Just like Nehemiah. No matter what the cost. Do you realize it's your call? Just like it was Nehemiah's. He could have said, okay, God, this is all good and fuzzy and warmy feeling. But I'm not going before that earthly king because he may kill me. It's not worth it. And guess what? Nehemiah would have missed a huge blessing. Nehemiah would not have reached his full potential in which God had for him to accomplish. God's ready for, to accomplish your full potential. But he needs you to say, yes, God, no matter what the cost. Let's pray. Father, we love you.